Shia, thank you. Thank you, Shia, and it's great to be with all of you um, tonight uh, for about an hour, and I'll talk a little bit for 30 minutes or 40 minutes and be happy to discuss with you one of the most fascinating evolutions in, in modern history, and that's this evolution of this virus that you can't see, you can't touch, you can't smell, didn't exist as we know it today when, when I was a, a medical student at, at Harvard, uh, or barely existed when I came back here in 1983, because uh, we didn't know what it was. In 1981, this, this little virus appeared on the West Coast. Probably, it was in Africa before that called wasting disease, but we didn't know all that then. And then the virus itself, I watched from the time I was a resident at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston when we saw those early cases in 1983, 84, and watched it kill 500 people and then 1,000, and then 2,000, and then 5,000, then 10,000, then 50,000, then 100,000, then a half a million, then a million, then 5 million, and then 10 million, then 20 million, and then 30 million, or about 23 million before we woke up and said that we, as a people, have a responsibility, an obligation, a, a, a really moral uh, responsibility to address this little virus that ultimately, in all likelihood, even today, will kill another 40 million people. So it's a fascinating story, and I'll weave some stories in and out some of which are personal, some of which are, are policy, some of which will take you to the, the floor of the United States Senate, and also to the heart of Africa, where I've had the privilege and, and the, the honor, the huge, really a humble honor, to be able to go and take care of HIV AIDS uh, patients uh, there and indeed in other parts of, of the world. Hope Through Healing Hands, uh, is an organization that I run here that I'll come back to at the end, because at the end of it, you sort of sit and you hear these stories and you say, well, what can I do? And tied in with our discussion tonight will be some stories about what individuals have done, but what can you do, or what can each of us do? And we'll come back to Hope Through Healing Hands, which is a foundation that is now about, oh, seven years old, that Jenny Dyer, who's with me and was just mentioned, uh, actually runs. I had this little saying of using health as a currency for peace. And remember that, it's, it is what I really feel. And right now, as we speak, the President's talking about Afghanistan, and or he'll be talking here in about 30 minutes about that. And whether it's Iraq, Afghanistan, Iran, North Korea, this whole idea of using health and medicine and attacking viruses and building health systems has a real role in terms of peace and understanding uh, around the world, and we'll come back to that um, um, uh, as well. Let me tell you what I'd like to do tonight, and I'm gonna move quickly, and there's probably more data than you want, and I'll go quickly, and some of it I won't talk about directly on the, on the slides, but I wanna get it out to you because you wouldn't be here if you didn't care something about it, the virus itself, or malaria, or tuberculosis, or pneumonia, or these silent killers that are out there that we can reverse uh, over time. And therefore, I do want to give you enough information to be able to take with you uh, overall. So I do want to cover the fact that we're still getting beat today. Secondly, the history of HIV. Yeah, we have a lot to be proud of that we do, you do. The American taxpayer leads the world in both generosity and in terms of focus of addressing this virus. But at number four, we're not winning this war but our investments are paying off. A little bit about President Obama's Global Health Initiative, which is truly visionary, and I'll let, you'll hear a few of his words uh, tonight directly, and then coming back to you. We've been at it 28 years, and it's gone by like that. And I remember to this day, when I was a second year resident in Boston, that we had somebody that came in with a debilitating illness. The immune system was down, and we had no earthly idea what it was. But the great epidemiologists at the CDC and really with academic health centers around the world within 18 months figured out that a group of people, initially five on the West Coast, were dying of a virus. We didn't know what the virus was. It didn't have a name. We had no earthly idea how to treat it. But we knew it was a virus, and therefore we needed to handle it 
as toxin of some sort, as blood being toxic. Before that time as a surgeon, you know, I'd come home to, to Karen at night, I'd have blood all over me from doing heart surgery, which at the time was fairly bloody surgery, and blood was sterile. You didn't have to worry anything about blood at all. It didn't matter if it got in your face or in the cuts. And then all of a sudden, for the first time in 1983, we said, no, every time we go into an operating room, any time we get blood on us, we've got to be careful. Make sure we have no open wounds. Put on two pair of gloves. Wear a double mask. Wear a shield over the mask itself. Totally revolutionized the way that we were taking care and changed the way we were taking care of, of patients. I oftentimes say that this virus has a hollowing out of society a, a effect. And the hollowing out comes from this graph. And look at the graphics. Don't, don't worry too much about what it says in terms of, of the numbers and all. But each of the bars going up is somebody zero to five years of age at one bar, five to 10 years of age, and 10 to 15 or five year increments. On the right, your right are females, on the left is males. And what this basically says, it's a chart that's now about six or seven years old. The sad part is it still applies today. But it says if this virus did not exist, the big outside margins, the green, it's green and red together, would be the projection of what in Botswana, a country where the average length of life is still only about 43, 44 years of age because of this virus. If we didn't have the virus, that's how many people would live. But with that virus, everybody in red is going to die. And this is projected by 2020, and the data really have, hasn't changed that much. But this hollowing out of society, which this little virus does, in that in many ways it gets the most productive element of our society, people 15 to about 30 years of age, when they are the civic leaders, when they're the teachers, they're the police, they're the people who are active in communities and just wipes them out. So this hollowing out of society is the image that we should all keep. The numbers, don't, again, don't pay too much attention to the numbers, but get the first one there. The number of people living with HIV in 2008 is about 33.4 million people. So when somebody says how many people have HIV today, it's 33.4. You can see there about two of those, two million are under the age of 15 years of age. Newly infected people are about 2.7 million and AIDS deaths, the last row there, is about 2 million. I'll come back to that, but the importance of the 2.7 million people is this, that every day coming through that door are 2.7 million people. And at the most, I'm able to treat, in the total of everybody out there, about 4 million people with antiretrovirals. So uh, in antiretrovirals are the drugs that we have. Powerful drugs, didn't exist. Most of them were invented actually in, in America today, which shows how powerful America, science, the academies like Vanderbilt, the Harvards of the world, Stanford's of the world are out there really inventing these. The problem we have today is that for every one person who comes in with HIV who we can put on an antiretroviral, there are four people coming through that door with new infections. And so I'll come a little bit, you can't treat your way out of this. We don't have enough money to buy the antiretrovirals when for every one person with all the success today, we put on antiretrovirals, but we have four people coming in that very minute. In another one we treat, but four people coming in. And that's the significance when I say that you can't treat your way out of this uh, in infection. How big a problem is it? About it, it's interesting. We're here to, to, to really celebrate in many ways the successive the so successes against HIV AIDS, how far we've come, the remarkable genius and the magic, the ingenuity of the American people, the intellectual capital that we've applied, which is reversing the course, but not yet. A month ago, we celebrated a pneumonia week. Why do we celebrate pneumonia week? It's because of pneumonia, if you look at little kids under the age of five, if you added up all the people who die of HIV kids and all the kids who die of malaria and all who die of tuberculosis, you still wouldn't have as many who die of pneumonia. And pneumonia you can treat with about 20 to 30 cents of antibiotics. HIV costs in Africa now about $120, $130 to treat for a year and you never cure it. So shouldn't America be addressing all of the pneumonia out there today? I, it's not the purpose of tonight's talk, but it's important to put in perspective 
of the why we do and have stood up and fought HIV and must continue because we have no cure. For every one person we treat, we've got three to four to five people coming in, in the room. So I show this slide to show that for kids under the age of five, most kids don't die of, of HIV. We'll come back and relate why it's so important to address that virus. I'm not gonna talk about HIV in the United States per se, it, 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 in terms of most of what I say tonight, because I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about mission trips and, and where the virus started, how it started, what we can actually do. But this slide shows, and it's, it's a little bit hard to read there, but in that top line, it shows that since 2003, when we had 38,000 people diagnosed, newly diagnosed, today it's down to about 35,000. And that's good because it means fewer people are coming in with HIV today. Deaths of persons with AIDS was 17,000 in 2003, it has gone down to 14,000, and that's progress here in the United States. But the really fascinating thing is that persons living with AIDS has gone from about 372,000 in 2003, gone up 50% to 2007 because of the success where people with HIV in America, because of the great progress with the drugs that we have today, can live and live normal lives. You'll hear a lot about spending overseas. I'm gonna come back to say we need to continue to invest in sustainable health systems focused on the delivery of medicines like HIV, AIDS, and malaria. But after I give this talk, and always people will come up and say, what about us here at home? Why spend all the money overseas when we still have these numbers here? And just so you'll know, we are spending about oh, $15 billion a year here if we're spending about $5 billion overseas. So we are investing here through tremendous programs like the Ryan White program. It's not gonna be what I talk about or I'm talking about tonight principally, but it is a huge part, a much larger part than our global effort coming through. History of HIV, my experience, and part of what I was asked to talk about is the personal side of how a doctor grew up in Nashville, Tennessee. I live three miles from here in the same house that I grew up in. When I, go, when I leave here tonight, I'm gonna to be sleeping in the same bed I slept in 55 years ago uh, tonight, which is un unusual. But how in the world somebody like me ended up in Uganda and ended up in each of these countries that are colored on that map, not as a politician, but as a doctor taking care of HIV AIDS patients. And it really started with this other guy, Dr. Dick Furman, working with a faith-based group called uh, Samaritan's Purse, and kind of just showing up one, one year with them and having my eyes opened up to the fact that there were not just a few people dying of HIV, but there were hospitals and clinics dying and whole towns being hollowed out like that slide in, in Botswana. So a lot of what I say is not being a United States Senator, but actually being a volunteer working with a faith-based organization, yes, being a doctor, but ultimately going to Washington where HIV had been up to that time ignored, and I'll show you the numbers on that, and basically sharing those stories like, like we are, are tonight. On the floor of the, in, in 1996, on the floor of the United States Senate, because I went there in 1995, and I'd taken care of AIDS patients here at Vanderbilt, and I had in Boston, and I had out in California, but I noticed in Washington, nobody, nobody was paying attention to the global phenomenon itself. I went to the floor and said that HIV AIDS is the greatest moral, humanitarian, and public health, it's and, because you need all of those, challenge of our lifetimes. From the medical missions in Africa, I started coming back. President Bush came in in 2000. Remember, he was a Republican who had never traveled outside of the country. He may have traveled somewhere, but I'm not sure. He hadn't traveled to Africa. But because I would bring back pictures of three people sleeping to a bed, all of whom would be dead within a month because they had HIV with two pairs of feet here and a head, and two heads down there and a pair of feet, really debilitated by HIV, I started bringing these pictures back. And the ears that were listening were people like Josh Bolton, President Bush's chief of staff, Mark Dybal, who most of you know became really the, the instrument to run PEPFAR uh, later, a guy by the name called Michael Gerson, who was the president's speechwriter. He just sat in Starbucks all the time writing his speeches. But again, people listened, and the president of the United States listened. So those discussions started right after the president had been there. And again, you wouldn't think a Republican 
who seems sort of out of sync with sort of this, what the stigma of HIV would be listening so carefully, and certainly not the way the press uh, paints it. In 2002, Karen, my wife, out of Lubbock, Texas, we were married, she put up with heart surgery, and she put up with 10 years of me doing heart and lung transplants here, me losing my mind and going to the United States Senate. And I went to dinner with the president and eight other people and it was late December, I have 2002, it may have even been that first week in, in January, and the President of the United States and other people there were Colin Powell and Condi Rice and a couple of other people, but it, I was there and I said, why am I there? I'm not a part of the cabinet, I'm in the legislative branch of government. And he basically looked me in the eye and said in two weeks, or maybe in three weeks, he said, I'm gonna go to the floor of the United States Senate or the House of Representatives and in the State of the Union make the single largest commitment in the history of the world to fight a single virus. And I, I remember it vividly, but even at the red, you know, there's a red room and a green room, and those rooms you kind of go on tours when you're in Washington, D.C. Well, for little dinners, occasionally they're used, and we were in the red room, I remember it vividly, because I'd been through there as a little boy uh, so much. And I remember that conversation. And indeed, in, on January uh, 23rd, the President in the State of the Union Address said these words. Uh, it was about two-thirds away through the State of the Union, and it hit me, but in truth, I was doing interviews later that night in Statuary Hall, and all the congressmen kind of crowd in there and do interviews for back at home. And I kept talking about this statement, but nobody else. On CNN, um, I remember Juan Williams interviewing me, and he said, what did the president say tonight? And I went straight to this statement, and he said, well, you know, why do you pick that statement out? And ultimately, five or six years later, when I can say that instead of 50 million people dying, it's 40 million people dying, that's why I made that statement. I asked the Congress to commit $15 billion over the next five years, including nearly $10 billion in new money to turn the tide against AIDS in the most afflicted nations of Africa and the Caribbean. The nation can lead the world in sparing innocent people from a plague uh, of nature, the words of the president. The hollowing out of societies, I'll show this picture because this is Bono. Bono and I, again, sort of an unlikely pair, with no staff, uh, went to Africa. He called me in January of, uh, this was, I guess, 2000, or 2001, I guess, and Bono had been working a lot in famine and then debt relief, but had become interested in clean water predominantly, and he was just getting interested in HIV, and he knew that I'd spent a lot of time on the ground treating HIV, so he called me, I was in Florida at the time, he said, in a month, let's be in Africa, and indeed, a month passed, and we met in Uganda, in northern Uganda, and without all of his band of, of uh, groupies, and without any of my staff, we toured northern Uganda to see what the ravages of HIV were, but also whether treatments would work. I mentioned because much of the culture change to, to destigmatize HIV AIDS comes from charismatic people like Bono, totally outside of the medical field, and not just an entertainer trying to get, to get information, but with a real moral commitment to fighting, fighting this um, virus. So there we were in 2004, that's when all this began to happen, and the PEPFAR funding, which is the President's Emergency Program to Fight HIV, got started, and nobody believed that truly $15 billion would be spent. And you can see over that period up to 2009, about not $15 billion, but $19 billion were actually uh, spent. Again, against a virus that had been stigmatized so strongly in this country and around the world. It's a real tribute, not just to the administration, but to the American taxpayer to stand up. But what was interesting, I didn't start this chart to 2004, was that in 2002, we were only spending 400 million, not billion dollars. I drew the arrow, I should draw the line in there. That's as much as we could muster through the 1990s when millions, three million people were dying around the world every year. Two and a half to three million were dying every single year on our watch. I was in the Congress, so I blame myself. In part, President Clinton will tell you his single greatest failure as President of the United States was not to address this virus. Yet you had this right-wing guy, President Bush, come in and, and get it and pull it through. And then I'll show you what President Obama, which is taking what President Bush did and projecting it even uh, uh, much, much, much bigger and I'm not sure if you'll get the funding for that. So that's the PEPFAR funding. And so you got PEPFAR funding, which is the United States taxpayer, and then you've got the global funding, which is the global fund, where you have 44 nations paying into a single fund and then investing money around the world. And again, the United States of America 
made the first investment in this new global fund, a multilateral fund, which also is treating people around uh, the world. And you can see in that second to the last bar there, there, that we're right at about a billion dollars a year through this second big vehicle in terms of, of funding. So we lead the world by far. That's money, and money is important. And this is the money end of it. It shows the funding overall. The last two lines there, $19.2 billion over five years, the initial commitment of $15 billion. But in terms of the reach, what the American taxpayer has done is unprecedented from any other country in the world, and that is, this is the reach. The image is basically that. We're covering the world with your taxpayer dollars to fight this single uh, virus. The global fund itself, so you got PEPFAR, $19 billion in the first five years. You got the global fund now up to about a billion dollars itself. We give more money than anybody to the global fund. In fact, of all the global fund out there, the, the American taxpayer gives about a third of that global fund as well. And one of the problems we have is having the rest of the world stand up and take an ownership for this virus that we thought was just kind of in Africa but in truth, the greatest number of HIV AIDS cases in the world is not in Africa, but it's in India, or any country in Africa, but it's in India. And the fastest growing number of cases is not in Africa, but it's in countries like Russia. So it's time for the rest of the world also to stand up. NIH, unprecedented in terms of the intellectual capital and investment, $34 billion in NIH research on this single virus. And remember, we're out there fighting thousands of viruses uh, out there today. We've got H1N1 now, we had swine flu, we have uh, bird flu, we've had the routine virus. By far, $34 billion in NIH research on this single virus. People ask me all the time, so I give you the number of how much we've spent as a society fighting this virus since 1981, and right now it's right at $200 billion. Nothing else, nothing else, no other single disease caused by a virus or bacteria can touch that. Um, in addition, I just list some things. The data itself is not important, but so you'll know. 10.1 million people have been provided with care, including more than 4 million orphans, vulnerable children. There are right now about 16 million HIV AIDS orphans in, in, um, in uh, Africa. 33 million people have been influenced by voluntary counseling and testing. Services on mother-to-child transmission, 12.7 million. The pregnancies, the partnering through the PEPFAR program is unprecedented. But four people coming in, we can afford treating one, we're losing the battle. There is no cure for HIV AIDS. The uh, Tachi Yamada who runs, um, who runs the Gates Foundation was here on campus. Many of you, I'm sure, heard him about, oh, eight months ago, six or seven months ago. And he's talking about throwing the long ball through the Gates Foundation. The Gates Foundation basically is, is looking for that vaccine. But you have a virus that's kind of like a napkin. If you had a napkin or cloth napkin and you passed it from one person to another, it's kind of like that AIDS virus. By the time you get it and you pass it to somebody else, it's kind of hard. It kind of comes unfolded and then it flops around. That virus is changing. It's a cagey virus. It's changing all the time. So you got that and you put a vaccine, but by the time you get your vaccine on it, it's changed its confirmation. So that's why this vaccine is, is so hard. But the Gates Foundation is not really in the prevention, care, and treatment. They're in the long ball for the cure. But if I just told you another 40 million people are going to die of this virus, what about if they do get it? So it's thinking outside of the box. Let me just keep going. Now, this is interesting because this was just yesterday. So I told you we have 2.7 new infections coming through that door every year. Every year. This keeps piling up. We have right now about 4 million people on antiretrovirals. So you got 2.7 million coming in, 4 million total. That's all we can pay for. Look how much, I just told you how much billions and billions of dollars we're spending. My point is you can't treat your way out of this virus once again. So WHO yesterday, or maybe the day before, released, released new guidelines to start therapy earlier, because we know if you start therapy earlier, you have a much better quality of life. And so you typically in Africa start therapy when a count called the CD4 gets down to a certain level, and now the guidelines have been changed to a lower threshold where you, you should start ARVs a lot earlier, but if we've got five million people waiting for all these people coming in, five million of them waiting to be on this waiting list, 
Just with yesterday, we added another four million. There are nine billion people now essentially waiting for these antiretroviral uh, treatment. So I show this slide on prevention, care, and treatment because a policymaker has to decide of all this money coming in, the AIDS advocates say, give it to me because I need the treatment. You have all these people coming in, so you need to spend all the money on ARV. But since you can't treat your way out of it, you've got to get the fundamentals and figure it out and use your genius, use your, cat, use your intellectual capital to figure out what's causing the virus. And therefore, you need to come in and look at care and look at, at prevention as, as well. And that's the tensions. We're not really even penetrating with mother-to-child transmission to the degree that we should. And that's cheap. That's really about 2 to $3, a drug called nivirapine, that if somebody's been exposed to the HIV AIDS virus and you give one dose before or during pregnancy or delivery and one and sometimes two doses after can essentially be curative or preventive overall. But this slide basically shows that 15% of HIV exposed infants had HIV testing in the first two months of life. What about the other 85%? And the slide itself you can't really see, but what those are is penetration. And the average there is about 25% or 17% or 22% of the little babies and moms who should be treated, who are being treated, but what about the other 80% today? So we have a long way to go, tremendous progress, but a lot more to do. Our investments are paying um, uh, off. And right now I have living proof, if you watch TV and you hear Melinda Gates and Bill Gates right now, they just started a campaign, basically with the same message that I'm giving you, and that is that our investments in the past are making a huge difference. One of the campaigns that I've worked with is the One Campaign, and Emily Zern, who is here, and, and several of the other officers are here, here tonight from the one campaign here. And I want to show you a short video, which really captures, I think, three things. First of all, you have HIV, malaria, and AIDS. We're making real progress. Number two, we need to be proud of the success that we've had today. And we need to celebrate that success, really to keep people inspired to continue to invest in the future. And number three, it is a bipartisan effort. And the video that I'll show you is a video that was shot not this summer, but the summer before that, just 16 months ago, or 50, yeah, about 16 months ago, that was a month before the Republican convention and the Democratic convention, at the height of partisanship of people at each other. But very quietly through the one campaign, and the campaign that I was chairing called One Vote 08, I took to Rwanda, a country that I'd been in many times because it's just a great sort of crucible of, of HIV AIDS and the things that are done, Tom Daschle, me Republican, him Democrat. Uh, Mike Huckabee, who at the time was running for President of the United States, but also John Podesta, the Clinton, uh, President uh, Clinton's Chief uh, of Staff. Um, who else do we have? Cindy McCain, at the time, John McCain, Republican nominee, but very quietly, Cindy McCain down there, you'll see her in the one shirt. My point is the HIV AIDS is truly bipartisan. You see the, the tremendous leadership of Obama today, what President Clinton is doing out there with the Clinton Global Initiative, coupled with what I've talked to you about with President Bush. So with that, let me show you just real quickly the HIV, AIDS, malaria, the living proof that is out there today, and we'll show that video, and the um, importance of the bipartisanship. I think that what we've seen is a dramatic change in circumstances in a very short period of time, giving people hope and better health and a real chance at a much better future. I really want to showcase this, this success story so that we can energize the American people and people in high levels in government. children are a message to a future that we will not see. We may not see their future, but it's brighter as a result of what's happening here. You can see it on their faces, and you hear it with their stories. 
one is a kind of unique campaign that it blends Democrats and Republicans and citizens, really. It's really a nonpartisan effort blending citizens across the country to try uh, to impact uh, biggest problems in Africa and, and, and affecting poor people around the world. With the help of uh, America, the Rwandans have cut their malaria death rates by two-thirds, tripled the number of kids who are sleeping under mosquito bed nets uh, as a result of help from the United States. And I think the people of America really ought to be proud That's of John what's Podesta, happened here and the ability President to kind Chief of support of these people who are coming from such a, a low base and such a tragic history and being able to rebuild their society and rebuild their lives. true desire of all mankind is not only to live free lives, but lives marked by dignity and opportunity, by security and simple justice. Delivering on these universal aspirations requires basic sustenance, food and clean water, medicine and shelter. It requires building the capacities of the world's weakest states and providing them what they need to reduce poverty, build healthy and educated communities, develop markets, and generate wealth. Now it's our moment to lead, our generation's time to tell another great American story. We are coming together. We are joining our voices to make a real difference. Will you? So we've sort of walked through a little bit of the science of it, a little bit of the, the personal aspect uh, of it for me, President Bush, really almost out of the blue, explosion in terms of investment, which has changed the course of humanity, no question about it. And now we're with President Obama today, who is taking what really a series of probably over 15 years, great scientists, great politicians, I think, today, great public servants ha have done. And a little bit about that. How much do you know? And Right now, people don't know very much about it because President Obama has been focused very much, and appropriately so, on his speech tonight with Afghanistan and our health issues right here, but it's important for, for you to know. Right now, how willing are Americans to invest in global health issues, whether it's the pneumonia, whether it's malaria, which kills about two million people a year, uh, or a million people a year, most of those are little kids, and most of those are, are in Africa today, um, or in the 16,000 preventable deaths under the age of five, largely both pneumonia but also from clean water. But how willing are we as a country? And this is out of the field now just a, a, um, in October, now about a month or two months ago. And the question is, given the serious economic problems, that is the recession that we're just beginning to recover from uh, now, facing the country and the world right now, can we afford or can we not afford? And both of these are basically the same, but in October of this year, 62% of people say that the United States cannot afford to spend more money on improving health for people in developing countries. And 33% basically say it is now more important than ever for to U.S. to spend that money. So we have a long way to go in terms of the understandings of the importance, the security reasons, the moral reasons, and the health reasons out there uh, today. Public awareness of Obama's Global Health Initiative today, if you look at the green, very little, about 40%, nothing at all, 25%, a lot, only 10%. So in leaving tonight, you need to know what President Obama's Global Health Initiative is. It is very exciting, and it's this. He's requested about $8.6 billion, or $63 billion over six years, to, to shape a really comprehensive global health strategy very different than what we did in Washington, or President Bush did, which targeted HIV, which targeted malaria, which targeted tuberculosis. So this is a major shift, a positive shift and a very appropriate shift for the times. We cannot simply confront individual preventable illnesses in isolation. Why? Because we don't have enough money to be able to treat every single disease, and the money that we spend can't be spent well if we can't really take care of the whole patient today the effective antiretroviral therapy if we don't have the appropriate refrigeration or the appropriate delivery or the appropriate follow-up in the long run does no good. So though PEPFAR itself, the HIV, AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis money, will uh, consume about 70% of the budget, the president's budget, 
President Obama's budget, really for the first time, will focus on these much broader global health challenges of child and maternal health. 10 million kids under the age of five die every year, 25,000 a day, 16,000 die of preventable diseases that are easily treatable, that are cheap, that have been proven uh, in the past. Issues surrounding clean water, family planning, tropical diseases that have been ignored in the past. And the last one, and the most important one, I think, is developing and strengthening comprehensive health systems themselves, by which you can put community health workers, through which you can put community health workers to address disease. Right now, do people support, will the American taxpayers support building systems instead of supporting individual diseases? The reality is you can no longer support individual diseases without comprehensive systems, but that's too complicated. And actually the data, again, this is out of the field two weeks ago, is pretty encouraging. It basically says there is some discussion about how best to distribute U.S. aid for improving health in developing countries. Which do you think is more important, systems or individual diseases? And systems has about 60%. And that's very encouraging because that's where President Obama is putting the emphasis. I'll mention but not go into detail, I was on the phone earlier tonight or later this afternoon, early late this afternoon, there is a new initiative that stresses systems called the Millennium Challenge Corporation. And what that basically says, because the American taxpayer does not want to give foreign aid generically. If you say we're going to give foreign aid that's going to focus on health, they're willing to give that. But right now, if you don't link it to the, to the health, you simply won't. The Millennium Challenge Corporation is a brand new entity. You have USAID to which we give a lot of the foreign aid. This is a little subgroup that the American taxpayer has put about $7 billion into. We give about a billion dollars away to the 17 poorest countries in the world, but we don't give it to those countries unless they're held accountable for it. They've got to re report results, they've got to measure results, They've got to be on the road to investing themselves in their own people in education and in health care, and they've got to be partnering with all sorts of institutions, government with the private sector, gov their government with our government before the money is given to them. I mention that really for the students here who are studying new entities to which foreign aid can be given effectively so that Bill Frist, when he's over in Cleveland, Tennessee, or Saudi Daisy, Tennessee, as a politician, as a public figure, can look the taxpayer in the eye and say, give me a dollar. I'm going to invest it in HIV, AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis, clean water, global health, and the result is going to be there. It's going to save lives. And historically, we hadn't been able to do that. Our country has raised wasted 60 or 70, 80 billion dollars of foreign aid that goes into corrupt governments, take it overseas, it never gets there. And when I'm in Saudi Daisy trying to say, taxpayer, give me money, it makes sense. I've got to show the investment pays off. And this is just one example of an entity will do that. So I'm going to bring this back to you and, and really close with this. What can you do? And I've sort of serendipitously fallen in these situations and in and, and mixed politics and health care live here in, in, in Nashville and started here in Nashville, and I'm at it. And I, this is where I spend my life with, with Jenny and both in travel, in educating and working, because I know that you can, through three paragraphs in a piece of legislation that I signed, that we sent to the President of the United States, we saved 10 million people. 10 million people. And that's, what, that's the goodness of government. And that's why this bipartisanship I wanted to show you because that's real. It's not what you see on Sunday on TV in the morning. And it's not what you see at night on, on all hardball and all that stuff. But that was all of us together at the height, at the height of the political partisanship four months before the convention when you had people from both parties together. Let me show you one of the things you can do. Let's go to this second video just to show you a little bit. This is from a few years ago of me sliding into the whole world of mission-based service. Right now I stand in a mission-based hospital here in Louis, Sudan. The Sudan, a long way from the United States of America. Louis, about a thousand miles south of Khartoum and 500 miles west of the Nile River. Over these next few minutes, I'd like to share with you some of my personal experiences at that mission hospital in Louis, Sudan.
was five years ago uh, that I first came into this airport. And today, the fact we're coming in on the Samaritan's Purse DC-3, the fact that we have uh, people here who are joyful gives me a great deal of satisfaction and pride to be able to come back uh, to, to Louis. When I first came here five years ago, I had no earthly idea what I was about to see. At that time, we began to operate in a small little schoolhouse. We operated by flashlights on that, at that first uh, night. The operating room, over time, has uh, changed uh, dramatically. Well, we're scrubbing here in Louis Sedan, uh, a long way from the United States of America. And that's, you can see our scrub sink's a little more primitive. The water's coming through that window to a, a tank outside. Uh, about three years ago when I was here, we had a big old coffee urn sitting right here. Today it's a little bit different. Real progress, still not like the United States. All of this shows to me what the power of the Lord can do, bringing the right people together. Surgery is being performed about 100 yards from where I, I'm standing right now in as sophisticated a way as you can find back in the United States uh, anywhere. It's truly, truly a, a miracle. One of the real privileges that I have is to go on rounds with the wonderful nurses and physicians of this health facility. You walk into that ward, that room, and you see beds lined up on either side. And it's a little bit dark when you first look in the room, but you see those wide smiles of the patients, patients who otherwise would have no hope, would have absolutely no access to any health care whatsoever. It's not Samaritan's Purse. It's not people from the United States of America, but it's the community. So what's been instilled from day one is that every patient who comes here gives something, pays some little bit. Now right behind the hospital, just a, a few yards behind the hospital itself, on the hospital grounds, and, and sorghum is actually put into this and is ground through, and a lot of the patients are actually participate in this process in order to pay in part for their health care here. Again, everybody pays a little bit of something, and this is the way many of the people actually uh, participate. It's a wonderful approach, which I think explains much of the success of this wonderful facility. For 20 years, I practiced medicine, went through medical school, residency, heart and lung transplantation, operating at some of the most sophisticated facilities in the world. After that, I had the opportunity to come here. My life has been changed. It doesn't take necessarily spending two years or three years. You might come here for six months or one month. But that opportunity to give unselfishly is something that otherwise you cannot capture in any way. It's a dream come true. Having seen the humanity, having seen the hope, having seen that humanitarian love and caring that is shared back and forth, it will forever change your life. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share with you from the heart of Africa what the medical mission field can do for others, but also what it can do for you. It's an example of uh, opportunities that a lot of you who are students uh, here have. And it doesn't have to be as an undergraduate necessarily. It doesn't have to be in a uh, interim program or in the summer. And it might be if you're going to medical school, fine, or if you're in nursing school, fine or in engineering school, and it may be five years from now, maybe 10 years from now. I do want to encourage you to do that sort of thing, even if it's a one-week mission trip, because it'll open your eyes, it'll put you out, outside of the box that you usually live in. And many of you in the room, I, I'm sure, have done just that, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. It captures this, this oneness of, of humanity that cannot really, uh, can be talked about and you can read about it, but otherwise you just can't uh, capture it. I opened with Hope Through Healing Hands and using health as a currency for, for peace and introduced uh, Jenny. And I really want to close with that because we actually build sustainable health systems using community health workers. And I think it's important for us to have people go over and have experiences, but I think it's also to link it to sustainable development in that country, which is really the, the thesis behind what we do. One of the things that is, is specific to Vanderbilt is that we have a program called Global Health Leaders 2010. And there are people in the room here who donate uh, to that program, investing in you because they're investing in health, but most importantly, they're investing in this oneness of, of humanity. In our uh, global health leaders, we've had people from Vanderbilt School of Medicine, the School of Nursing here, uh, residents from the Vanderbilt International Anesthesia Program, 
resident from the Vanderbilt uh, University Emergency Medicine Program. I mention that because those opportunities are not just through us, but they are through others, and I want to encourage all of you to, to use that. I, I will close really with this one story. Kelly uh, uh, Sheeta, who is at Vanderbilt University School of Nursing right now, is at Nehemiah Hospital in Rwanda. And we have a blog on our website, hopethroughhealinghands.org, which I encourage you to look at, because we have all of our global health scholars blogging back and telling these wonderful stories, these rich stories that just really just weren't popular to share, but now we can share it with millions of people uh, around the world. In his story, I'll just go real quickly, and this is um, obviously Kelly, Kelly there. It's been one month since I arrived in Rwanda, and I'm continually amazed at the obstacles my patients and coworkers face. The work can be very frustrating, Every day I see ways to keep people alive and reduce the severity of illnesses, but implementing change is never easily, easy, especially when resources are extremely limited. One particular frustration is the lack of hand washing by the medical staff. An estimated 60,000 people in Rwanda are infected with illnesses from in the hospital. Nosocomial infections are often caused by health providers not having properly washed their hands. So he saw this problem, he came in from the outside, but all the nurses and physicians know they're supposed to do that, but it's simply not practical. There are no sinks in the patient rooms. The nurses have to move quickly from patient to patient to provide care for everyone coming in. There's only one sink per, per, per floor, and it is located very far from the patients. Many of the patients have and are infected with HIV, tuberculosis. After two weeks of frustration, this nursing student who came from here found a solution. We go and squirt the stuff on our hands and it's outside all the doors now. Kelly, he knew that wasn't gonna be the case. And his solution, after talking to a lot of people, researching it, was to basically take some very, very simple, inexpensive things, mix them up, talk to the nurses and talk to the doctors and to the patients there of what they would use and what they wouldn't use. And now he shared that with that whole hospital. And now they have the appropriate uh, bactericidal, because you can't do the traditional hand washing, washing that will ultimately save lives. And it wouldn't have happened if a student like many of you in the room hadn't come forward and put together this program and had us support it there. It shows this sort of oneness once again of how one individual can make a, a difference. I'll close with a, a quotation that I use a lot because I think it captures when you, when you go through what we've walked through from the science and the genius and the creativity of the scientists out there fighting this virus that people in this audience have had loved ones die of at a time where it was unknown really just 28 years ago. And you see the progress that's been made, but that we're not yet winning it that it affects really indiscriminately anybody in every country in the world right here in Nashville and our own loved ones at the same time these faceless people in Africa and Rwanda where I've taken you tonight. It comes back to I think what, what Martin Luther King says and that is we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in this single garment of destiny and that what affects one directly, one directly affects all of us uh, indirectly. Thank you. It's been an honor for me being with you. That oneness of mankind, we're all part of it. Thank you very, very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we've got, we're going to, I know people need to keep moving tonight. There are two microphones there, and we'll take, uh, why don't we do about I don't know, 10 minutes of, of question and answer. I'll be quick. Uh, question, answer, discussion, comments, and um, we'll have you out of here. So please, if you've got a question, go to the microphone, uh, or if you don't want to go to the microphone, you can just stand up and shout. Somebody will go. Somebody's got to go first. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Jenny, grab the mic. Jenny, grab the microphone over there. Go ahead. Go keep talking. That's all right. I'll repeat it. Very well said. And and the question is is that we don't have a cure. It's very treatable, and that's the magic of the, the antiretroviral agents, 
all of which, or the majority of which have come from U.S. scientists today. It was on my, on my slide there. But we don't have a cure. And therefore, what do you do when you can't afford it? In the one slide where I showed you, you got prevention, care, and treatment. And research in each of those is the most exciting. And I think America is approaching it well. And I think the political leaders today are rationing or allocating appropriate resources. Because ultimately, prevention is the only thing that's going to do it if you don't have a cure. And the prevention is like in mother-to-child transmission. That's one type of prevention. Using uh, condoms is another type of prevention. Encouraging faithfulness instead of a lot of the cultures of many different tribes and many different nations is having multiple, multiple wives. Is addressing e issues like drug abuse. And it depends on what country you are and basically the use of IV injection needles and educating and not run away from those issues and look at issues like family planning and put them out there. And that takes a, a lot of courage out there. And our political leaders a lot of times don't have that courage. And we're making progress in the care, in the prevention, in the treatment. What we can't do is put all of our money into treatment because we don't have enough money to, to do just that. The great, great question. And I, I have to say the science, the figure I showed you about really the $200 uh, million being spent on, on, uh, uh, on research from NIH, the power of our research dollars today, since we don't have that cure, and the power of the Gates Foundation, who right now is putting more money in global health than our entire government today shows the importance of private philanthropy as well. Yes, sir. Grab, grab that microphone just since we got it there. Thank you. And I'll come over there. You have the microphone? You're next. Yes, sir. Can you say something about uh, the issue of infrastructure and healthcare systems and sustainability when you talk about what your program is doing and allude to what uh, the current president is about to do or would like to see done? given the differences in so many nations, so many healthcare systems, uh, how, just give an example yeah, of I think, I think it's a great question because this is a real challenge. Jenny and I were just in Washington, although I showed you that people kind of like the concept of health systems, if I say, give me $100 for health systems, that's not, you're not going to buy it, but if I say, give me $100 to save the life of a child dying of HIV AIDS, or give me $100 to buy 10 bed nets which will save three children, you're going to give me the money. So your question is critical because President Obama, rightfully, because we've exhausted, not, not exhausted, but we could spend unlimited money on each of these particular entities, and we're not going to have anywhere near the impact unless we invest in health systems. But an example, there'd be several examples. One would be probably the easiest community health worker. A community health worker today, what is a community health worker? Well, a community health worker is a, somebody who grew up in a community, a tribal area, with no specific training, who's given about a month or two months of training to recognize that pneumonia, for example, or that HIV AIDS, and knows how to take that person and get them to the appropriate resources itself. The appropriate resources may be a facility, it may be a clinic, it may be a, a, a tribal uh, traditional healer, it may be a doctor. That community health worker there's been no focus on, but it's part of the health care system. So, the government, so Obama, President Obama is going to be out there doing it, but he's got a hard time because nobody wants to give to a system. Now, what we do in, in Hope Through Healing Hands is work, for example, with the Vanderbilt Anesthesia Group here. And basically, by Jenny's great networking and pulling people together all over the state, we basically sort of came upon a tremendous initiative at Vanderbilt today that says at Kajabi Hospital in Kenya, we will send an anesthesia resident there for say three months, and that resident will train people and will come back, but also we will link through Hope Through Healing Hands, if we send that resident down there, we will train four nurse anesthetists who are going to stay on the ground at Kajabi Hospital and not move to the United States, not have the brain drain that will develop that sustainable infrastructure there. So you give me $10,000 today, I link them together, 5,000 anesthesia residents going over, link the training, five nurses who are going to stay there and who are going to address the problem where it is with the same culture and the same language. So those are two examples. And it is neat stuff, it's important stuff, it's doable stuff, and it hadn't been done before. And that's why I'm so convinced, having, I've, I've been in Africa a lot, and Bangladesh, and uh, around the world doing this stuff, and we're at this moment in time where this stuff can happen, can happen. Okay, I'm sorry. 
Thank you for coming to speak. My name is Kayla Mackey, and I'm from the Global Poverty Initiative, and I think it's great that these talks are going on. I was wondering about the personal aspect of what you do and how you decided to leave medicine and leave being a surgeon and go to the Senate and really lobby for these changes that are happening in government. Yeah, no, thank you. And, and part of it, again, is we were talking about what you talked about tonight is kind of that, and it can't do it all. But I grew up in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, here. This is it, this is home. I grew up uh, here. Mother and dad lived over on Bowling Avenue where I live now, and they uh, are committed to this community. You'll see things that are the vestiges. They were real humble people, and therefore they you know, wouldn't want their name anywhere. But you will see, whether it's the Visual Arts Center here, or whether it's CARE, or whether it's fighting HIV AIDS, the initial funding for that, a lot of it came from this tradition of dad of healing. But his healing was one-on-one, -on -one, and so I'd go around to Clarksville and around Tennessee with him, with my arm prepped up with five, five years of age on a doctor's bag. And I'd just sort of see him walk into a room and there'd be despair and people were dying and he'd walk in the room and give them hope. And they would smile and he'd touch them and he'd sit down and their life would be changed and give them the appropriate medicine. So I saw that and then went into medicine, uh, last of five children and ended up going into medicine and then the medicine healing one-on-one -on -one to me, which came from dad and mother and just the way I grew up, is uh, gravitated to heart surgery because it was new, it was an exciting field, and then transplantation because it was changing lives. Taking, and here we did it all. We did the first lung transplants here, taking lungs out and giving life to young women, the first heart transplants here, the first neonatal transplants here, the first combined heart-lung transplant in the South. It was all done about two blocks from here when we set up the transplant program. And then I asked myself, um, to be a vehicle, where would you have to go? This is honest truth, and it's written about in this book out here, is, is uh, where can you go to be the vehicle, or how do you be the vehicle to heal not just one-on-one, -on -one, or serve a community one-on-one, -on -one, but in a larger way? Be the vehicle. And so I didn't know, and not knowing was good, because there hadn't been a doctor run and win in the United States Senate since 1928. And everybody said it was impossible to do. But anyway, it ended up winning, not wanting to be a politician, knowing at that time and pledging at that time only to serve 12 years, because I'm more into the healing business, because that's what dad did, and it's fulfilling, and uh, so went there. And then I didn't know, well, I tried it, but President Clinton was not that interested and the Congress was not interested in all in fighting this particular virus, but keeping my eyes open, I saw it because I'd serendipitously fallen into Africa, and while I was there, saw a big problem that nobody was addressing. And from going down and working in little tukels with operating my flashlights with, with no running water, and then walking 48 hours later and being a United States Senator in the State of the Union message with all the glamour and all the pomp and all the, the, the greatness of America there, uh, saw we could do some stuff. And that's when I, I said, okay, let's do it. And so a lot of the HIV AIDS, a lot of the prescription drugs for seniors, the sort of debate that's going on in Washington today. And then uh, stay for 12 years, because that's the vehicle. And other people can do that, other people can move in. And so now I'm doing what, again, I write in this book, is, and the message really tonight, I think, and it applies to HIV and it applies to any big thing, is that we all need to go dig deep in our own lives. And I do it right, I'm 57 years old, and I'm doing the exact same thing that many of you in the room are doing, to find whatever your passions are. And it's tough. And the seniors, I'm senior too, but the seniors here are doing the same thing in saying, you know, what are my passions? And then figuring them out. It's tough, that's tough to do. And I'm still struggling with it. But you find them and then you shape them in such a way that comes back to service. And you have to actively shape them. You have to get advice and counsel and make mistakes and failures. One of the good things about my position, if you see all the good stuff, heart transplant surgeon, um, senator, majority leader, and all that, you don't see all the failures it takes. Um, uh, I don't want you to see that either. <laughs> Coming in and the hard work that it takes. But if you get those passions and you shape them, good things happen. Good things happen. So that's the personal story uh, coming in. And now I'm doing the same thing. And that's why I'm doing global health, and that's why we travel around the world, and that's why we speak to people, and that's why we hopefully inspire people to do the same things. I spend a lot of time, I'm teaching at Vanderbilt here at the business school and the medical school. We got some medical students and business students together. 
I taught at Princeton two years ago, and I absolutely believe that the strength and the magic that's going to solve these big problems is with our young people today. You're in a world where you can access information, you dream, it's big, you're smarter, and that's why I spend so much time with young, young people today. I'm sorry. Yes. Hi. I've actually spent my past few summers volunteering with HIV orphans at the Niambani Children's Home in Kenya, which I believe you're familiar with, and yes. the Leo Toto Outreach Program. Yes. Um, my time there, I've realized that although many of these children are lucky enough to be some of the ones that get the HRVs, aren't taking them because of the social stigma. If kids find out at school that they're infected, they're worried that no one will talk to them, they'll have no friends. So I'm just wondering what you're doing to address the social stigma itself. Yeah, tell, tell everybody, the Niambani Orphanage um, is an interesting place. It's right outside Nairobi. I don't know, can you even say how you got there? Yeah. That a father, D'Agostino, who doesn't matter what his name is, but had a great dream. But how did you end up there? Um, a teacher at my school had volunteered a few summers ago and actually left her job at my high school to start an educational service trip. So I've spent the past two summers working with her. And just again, to use sort of link all this together, because I don't think you and I have met, I've been down there a bunch of times, and, and behind the orphanage itself, you'll see a graveyard. And in that graveyard, you'll see just cross after cross after cross. And for each of those kids, it's a one-year-old, it's a three-year-old, it's a five-year-old. It's pretty powerful. And I took one of my sons, some of you know Jonathan, who are, who are here, would take them and Brian at individually one at a time to really have that experience that you did. AIDS orphans are about 16 million uh, uh, today. The stigma itself, the most powerful thing that can be done is to take what uh, people like Museveni of Uganda, the president of Uganda, who was the first African president that started about 15 years ago and said HIV AIDS, talked about it and opened every speech. And the great soccer players down there have sort of picked up on it as well. And basically said HIV AIDS is a terrible virus. There are things that you can do, but in truth, it's not that infectious of a virus. And to show themselves getting actually tested I think for, for countries that culturally look to their leaders and look to their churches, that's probably the very best way for the destigmatization it, itself. And it works. And it's grassroots. And it's cultural change. Let's take one more question. Any others? Yes. Let's see. Grab that microphone. Grab a microphone. Jenny Dyer. She does it all. Runs Hope Through Healing Hands. Let, let's grab that microphone. Go ahead and start. Where were, where were you? You were in Uganda. Where were you in Uganda? I was in Kampala. Uh -huh. I was working at a school, but thank you. Um, the majority of my comrades were working in clinics and hospitals. Um, and something that we discussed one night, I don't even know if anyone who was there remembers, was um, although there have been like huge advances in mother-to-child transmission, the problem that mothers who are HIV positive, who luckily have given birth to babies who are not HIV positive, can't breastfeed, and mothers coming in who have the choice of their starving baby because they can't afford formula or the formula is going into water that's not clean um, or breastfeeding, giving their infant HIV. And so I guess I just wanted to know what your opinion was on that problem or where we can go from here in sort of addressing feeding these babies who luckily have been born HIV negative. Yeah, no, it, it's a great question. The whole, we, we don't really have time to, but the whole mother to child transmission of HIV is uh, neat and it's miraculous, it's amazing because of what prevention and a health system can do. But it does take dosing over a period of time and getting people into a facility, which goes back to our health system argument where you can give niverapine or there's another drug that costs about a dollar and 20 cents. The idea of breastfeeding, again, you need a, a system to advise because on the one hand, you want women, especially where there's dirty water unclean water, which is most of Africa, not most of Africa, 70%, 1.2 billion people don't have access to clean water. After pneumonia, it's the number two killer. After pneumonia, it's the number one killer of kids under the age of five. So for the most part, you want women to breastfeed for a long period of time for the nutrients, for the immune system, for the sterility. If you're getting pneumonia and you have a good immune system because of breastfeeding, all of a sudden you can fight it. On the other hand, there are times when you do have drugs available that you want to be able to separate and say don't breastfeed because the HIV virus can be trans transmitted. It shows the importance of the healthcare systems and the community health worker with a systems uh, approach in order to make sure the care is, is most appropriate. 
Let me let me um, let me stop. The 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 book that that I referred to, and I'd be happy. I am going to be signing it outside. They called two days ago and said, "Will you sign the book?" I'd be happy to sign sign the book. In this book, these stories are are told. There is a, an opening chapter going into to the Sudan, where I actually started much of this work. It's where this medicine is a currency for peace. I actually describe it because we were flying at a time there's a civil war going on, where there was fighting going on. Three million, five million people displaced, two million people had died. And once we came in and delivered health care over a period of three years, all of a sudden fighting stopped because of that trust, because of the intimacy, because of the volunteer spirit. You were treating the good guys and the bad guys, and that is what I use as a health, as a currency for peace. Thank all of you for being here tonight. We're around. Uh, go to our website. It's hopethroughhealinghands.org. We're here. We'd be glad to talk to you. And with that, just with Martin Luther King, uh, I think is really caught so directly. We can change the course of humanity because if we affect one directly, we can affect all indirectly. Thank you all very much. Great to be with you tonight. Thank you. Thank you.